Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we bow before you. We pause to give you praise and adoration. We love you and we thank you for loving us uh, supremely in your Son, that there is nothing that uh, you have not done for us to secure everything that we need for godliness and salvation. We uh, thank you that we can look forward to this year with hope because you are with us and you promise never to leave us or forsake us. And that is true also in regard to the mission of the church and our engagement with the world. We pray, Father, that you would equip us well to declare the good news because without that, uh, there is no hope and um, people are just hoping for the virus to go away, but there's something more, far more deadly. And uh, we pray that you would give us opportunities to proclaim the good news. People might be safe from their sins. We ask that you bless our time together. We're thankful for those who are here, and we pray for those who could not make it, that you would heal them, help them to recover quickly. In Jesus' name, amen. Okay, so what we discuss in our former two sessions is more of an extended uh, presentation of the gospel, but as I said, it's not so much about a presentation as it is a entering into a conversation. So you have these verses, these illustrations, these transitions in your mind, you can use them as the Lord gives you wisdom and discretion, uh, but you need some sort of structure in your own mind of what you're going to say in advance. You don't want to just wing it. Is There are certain elements to the gospel about God, about man, about Christ, about faith and repentance that you want to communicate. Now, um, I would really encourage you, if you have not done so already, one, to write out your testimony and memorize it. And as I said, I'd be willing to take a look at that and give you input on it. And two, to memorize those key verses. You might have others that you want to use. There is a, such a thing called the Roman Road. Certain passages just in the book of Romans that people use to talk about uh, the gospel and lead someone to faith. Um, so that's another option. What I have for you today are a couple things. One are, are little summaries of the gospel. And these come in handy when you don't have a lot of time to talk to someone. It's not necessarily an elevator talk. Uh, some people will say in the marketing world, you know, you, you, you should be able to describe the vision of your company or something within the 30 seconds to a minute in the elevator talk or something like that. This is not so much an elevator talk because that would be <laughs> very, very uh, fast and I don't think that's necessarily the most appropriate time to get into it. But there are times that you, you just have a, a, a limited amount of, uh, of time to talk and you just want to summarize or this becomes a kind of a preamble to a longer conversation. There are different summaries, and I just want to, to go through them with you. Some I prefer more than others, but I'm, I'm giving you these uh, as a resource. The one that um, I do like is this Do Done uh, Summary. And this was modified by Steve Childers, who is with RTS. Um, but what he basically is saying, well, I'll just read. <laughs> Do. First, it's important to understand the difference between religion and Christianity. Religion is spelled do because it always consists of things people try to do to gain God's forgiveness and favor. The problem is we can never be sure we've done enough. Worse yet, the Bible tells us we can never do enough to measure up to God's perfect standard. But the good news of Christianity is spelled done, which means that what we could never do for ourselves, God has already done by sending his son to live the life we failed to live, to die on the cross, to pay the debt we deserve, to pay for the wrongs we've done. 
The good news is that God raised Jesus from the dead and now promises the free gift of forgiveness and supernatural power for living for anyone who will turn from their sin and self-trust and place their faith in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. Even if you don't express it in those exact terms, having that paradigm in your mind, do, done, is very helpful. So you're talking to someone and you say, you know, um, Christianity is like every, every other religion, and uh, so I, I don't really go for religion. So, you know, no, actually Christianity is unique. Uh, every other religion focuses on what you do to gain God's acceptance. But you can never be sure you've done enough, and the Bible says you really can't do it on your own. But Christianity focuses on what God has done for us. What we could not do for ourselves, God has done for us in Christ. That simple distinction, hopefully, will, you know, lodge into someone's brain and start to help them understand what, what you're basically communicating is that Christianity is a religion of grace. It's a, it's a grace-based as opposed to works-based. And that is unique to our faith. Even other religions that talk about grace or some semblance of grace always add works. So it's part grace, part works. Um, so that's a good one uh, to memorize. Now, how about if you were talking to someone who uh, was really entrenched in particular lifestyle or sin or maybe had an addiction? Uh, or if their life was just a mess and they're a party person or something like that. This is a good summary to, to use. Again, none of these are perfect and totally comprehensive in themselves. So, uh, and I'm showing you the resources and some, some people say, well, I'm not sure about this guy or that guy. I, I'm not commending uh, everything uh, written by Tim Keller or Bill Hybels or anything like that. I'm taking out what what might be helpful and you use it as you so uh, please and discern. So, the slavery freedom summary. We were built to live for God supremely, but instead we live for love, work, achievement, or morality to give us meaning and worth. Thus, every person, religious or non religious is worshiping something to obtain work but these things enslave us with guilt if we fail to attain them anger if someone blocks them from us fear if they are threatened or driven this since we must have them sin is worshiping anything but Jesus and sin is slavery now people don't think of sin that way people think of sin is I'm able to do as I please uh, I'm able to fulfill my desires without someone telling me, uh, you know, uh, what to do. They, they, you know, rebuff God. They, they put God at a distance. Um, so it's really about them indulging themselves. They think that this is the way to happiness and pleasure. But what happens is sin grabs them and enslaves them enslaves them to their desires and it ultimately brings about misery and guilt and shame and leads to deeper and deeper sins. So what we're trying to help people to understand is that the things that they look to to give their life security and significance can never provide that. And it is interesting if you think about that of how people respond to different things. So. Um, that there, there is the guilt associated with it uh, because you're unable to achieve a certain standard of your own. The anger, if someone blocks your goal or desire, that, that is true. People get angry because they want something and they're not able to get it. James talks about that uh, uh, in, in his epistle. Um, they, it could be the wrong things that they want, but they become angry because they're not able to get it. Or fear, because these things are threatened. 
How about if someone's significance is totally wrapped up in their occupation and they're fired? You know, that gave their life meaning and worth. Well, if that's taken away from them, what's life about? You know, I'm worthless, I'm meaningless now. Well, that's part of your, you know, your existence and calling, but that's not the whole of it, obviously. So there's much more to it. Anyway, freedom. As a fish is only free in water, we are only free when serving Jesus supremely. He's the only source of meaning that we cannot lose, freeing us from fear and anger, and that this is a free gift, uh, delivering us from guilt and drivenness. Okay, that is not the entire gospel. So I don't want you to think like, oh, that, that's a total substitute, because I didn't really talk about that in that summary there's not a lot about uh, sin and atonement or something these are ways to again uh, get into a conversation and highlight something that would warrant further investigation or a deeper conversation okay the law love summary uh, some this is helpful uh, some see God as simply a judge who demands we be moral and righteous. If God is not a judge, there is no help for the world. How else will wrong be punished? We all realize that wrong should be punished or else there will be total chaos and disorder. Love. Some see God simply as a father who loves us and doesn't want to punish us. If God is not a father, there's no hope for us. How can we be forgiven? But God is both. God is a, if a father was also a judge and the guilty child was brought before him, he would not acquit him. He could not just acquit him. How can God's love and law be reconciled? They're reconciled in Christ. So God doesn't compromise his, his holiness in the cross and he doesn't compromise his love in the cross. Uh, love and mercy and righteousness meet. They kiss together and uh, that's I think our, in our culture, people think of God as, well, God is loving and wouldn't judge anybody for their sin because he understands that we're human and we're prone to fail. So God just accepts everybody as they are. That is uh, false. Um, and uh, this helps to, um, to think about both sides of God's character in that way. All right, the last one, sin summary. Um, this is ultimately taken from John Stott's The Cross of Christ. Sin is substituting ourselves for God, putting ourselves where only God deserves to be in charge of our lives. Salvation is God substituting himself for us, putting himself where we only deserve to be dying on the cross. Did you, did you catch the, the language there? So it's a reversal. So sin is we substitute uh, ourselves for God. God, in his mercy, substituted himself for us. So the, the passage in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 5, 21, he became, uh, oh, oh my, I forget it. I shouldn't forget that. That is... He who knew no sin became sin for us that in him we might become the righteousness of God. That's it. So there's this exchange. He who knew no sin became sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God. Okay. So those are some things that you can have in your mind as you're talking about the faith or you're talking to someone who is, is saying, well, um, I don't believe in an organized religion. I think Christianity is like every other faith, um, or I believe God's a God of love and won't condemn anybody. These are just little things that you can say without getting into a very long, protracted conversation <coughs> to uh, address those sorts of things. So you can choose one of these summaries and perhaps add that to your tool belt uh, so that you can pull it out when you need it in discussing uh, the gospel with people. Okay, looking for opportunities. 
I've probably said this before, but it's worth repeating. This is from Bill Bright, who was the founder of Campus Crusade. And this statement is true. Success in witnessing is simply taking the initiative to share the gospel and the power of the Holy Spirit, leaving the results to God. Okay, what are some terms that stand out to you in that statement? Okay, wait, success, taking the initiative. Oh, leaving the results to God. Okay, let's let's talk about that. So, first, success. Again, what uh, we covered in the beginning is that people equate evangelism with conversion. So, if you have not led people to faith or if they have not uh, come to Christ yet, well, apparently you did something wrong. Uh, Charles Finney talked about the new measures and he thought there were certain ways that you could employ to basically move, persuade people to come to Christ if you just did it the right way. Uh, so very man-centered. Uh, do not like Charles Finney's theology. <laughs> Uh, he was originally a Presbyterian then, and then uh, ultimately turned away from the Westminster Standards. Um, so that, that is not the case. Evangelism, as we defined it, is simply proclaiming or announcing or testifying to the gospel. That's it. It just means to announce, to proclaim. If you share the gospel, you are successful. It's like Jeremiah. What's, what's success in ministry? It's obedience. If you say it's results, then Jeremiah was the worst failure <laughs> in the world because no one responded to his ministry. In fact, God told him in advance, people are going to reject you. They're not going to listen to you, but I still want you to testify to what I'm going to do, testify to the truth. Imagine having that call as a minister uh, Frank, I'm going to give you a work. No one's going to appreciate it or respond or care, and they're going to probably throw you in the pit sometime. Uh, but uh, this is what I want you to do. What? People are looking for success and you know, adulation and, and all this affirmation. But success in life is simply being obedient to God. Success in evangelism is taking the initiative. Why that's important is we have something precious to share. People are not going to come up to you and say, you know, I've been wondering about the gospel lately. I, and I think, I think you told me you were a Christian one time. I was wondering if you can explain it to me. Maybe that's gonna happen once in your life or something like that. Very rarely does that happen. I remember one encounter where something like that did happen. It was very interesting. So. I was discipling this young man at college. Um, this was my senior year. And I had talked to his friend uh, in the dorm, and he said, I'm not interested, I'm not interested at all. So that conversation didn't last long. A few weeks later, I was in the dorm room, Mike's room, talking with him, and his friend comes running in and he said, basically, I've had a miserable two weeks. Tell me how to become a Christian. Whatever God did during that time uh, unearthed his desperate need. His life was falling apart. And he's like, please tell me. That was a, a very, and, and he was sincere. He followed through, became a part of the movement, went to church. Incredible how God can get our attention very quickly. Um, so taking the initiative and then stepping out in faith, trusting that God will give you what you need to share the gospel and give you the courage to speak in the power of the Holy Spirit. So I don't say, well, I've memorized these different things. I know there are methods that I can use and formulas. And if I just articulate those well, then this is going to be successful. No, that's relying on yourself. You won't rely on the Holy Spirit. That's why you pray before, during, and after you're sharing. When someone else is talking, 
I'm listening to them, but I'm also praying, Lord, please continue to open their heart, help them to understand and so forth. But you pray before and you pray after that Satan won't, will take that seed that's on the path and steal it, uh, that it would penetrate and take root and, and bear fruit. But that's probably the hardest part for us, to take the initiative to actually turn it to a spiritual conversation and, and talk about, you know, the fundamental things, the eternal matters. Um, so, uh, initiating evangelism within the context of building relationships. We've uh, covered some of this ground. Listen, you don't need uh, any sign about sharing the gospel. Jesus has already commanded you to share the gospel and make disciples. So you don't have to say, does God want me to talk to this person? Well, if the person's not a Christian, yes, God wants you to talk to them. What time, the, the timing though, that's a matter of discernment. You know, if someone's uh, uh, about to, uh, you know, leave to go back to work, it, hey, hey, Frank, I, can I just say something to you in 10 seconds? That's not the time to share the gospel. There are other occasions that you can do that. But um, again, if we wait for our friends to be, bring up spiritual things, it may never happen. Focus on building bridges, establishing relationships. Now, uh, Mel, I'm gonna point you out because I'd like to do that and, and, and uh, get you uncomfortable. <laughs> Mel has a gift and I really appreciate it because God is very, God has enabled him to be very bold to take the initiative with people. So he's like, why wait? Which I appreciate because he's, we don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. We, we don't. So that that's a, a good perspective to have. Balance that though with people that you're going to be in community with over a period of time. And you realize you're going to be able to develop a relationship and build a platform or foundation of trust. And so you don't want to just dump on them, not that Mel does that, but you don't want to just dump on them all at once and say, well, I did my duty, and if they don't respond, it's their problem. Well, there, there's wisdom. You need wisdom in how you deal with each person. This is, uh, this is a very good quote uh, from Joseph Aldrich. This was a popular book in the 90s. And I like what he says about presence. So I, I know that I shared this quote to you uh, with, from Francis of Assisi who said, share the gospel and if necessary, use words. And that sounds you know, profound and very spiritual, but people don't come to faith by just watching your life. That provides integrity for what you're going to say and people will say, well, he, he walks the talk. I can trust that what he's going to say is genuine and authentic. If someone was a hypocrite, they say, you should live this way, you're going to discount them, right? So your life matters, but it's not enough just to have a presence. I remember talking to someone, a, a man who said, well, I said, tell me about your ministry. He said, I have a ministry of presence. <laughs> I said, and I don't want to laugh at him, but I said, tell me what that means. He says, well, I just go around and, you know, I go to different places locally and, and I'm just getting to know people. Well, that's fine if there's something more that's going to follow, but in and of itself, that's not enough. So let me read this quote for the sake of our two million uh, viewers on YouTube. <laughs> <laughs> the Christian loves his neighbor as a person, and evangelism becomes a byproduct of his self-giving love, not the reason for it. Okay, just a pause there. I want to share with people because I love them. It's not so that I feel good about what I'm doing. 
or uh, affirming my own worth as a Christian. It's because I love them, I'm concerned about them. Presence establishes the validity of what is being proclaimed. Presence alone is not enough. No one is good enough to just let his life speak for Christ. Words, proclamation are necessary to point beyond himself to Christ. Nevertheless, the unbeliever needs to feel the impact of the gospel, the good news that Christ loves people, not merely listen to it. When love is felt, the message is heard. But presence, which never leads to proclamation, is an extreme, is extreme to be avoided. We are fishers of men sent to catch fish, not frog men who dive under the water and swim with the fish, making our presence known. Okay, did you ever see those uh, documentaries where people are diving with the whales or something like that? They're just there. They're just having a presence. Well, they're really not doing anything more than that. So you can say, well, I just want to be an effective witness by loving people where I'm at. That's part of it, but certainly not all of it. And as people realize that you you do care about them, that you do love them, they'll begin to open up, they'll trust you, and they'll, they'll respect what you have to say. They may disagree with it, but they'll at least respect it because they respect you. Um, and that that is something to keep in mind. I'm not going to go over all these verses that encourage you to be active in sharing your faith. You can. Uh, read those on your own. I think we've covered some of that, but there is definitely an encouragement to pray for open doors and pray that God would give us opportunities to share the gospel. Uh, we talked about the fact that God is sovereign uh, and uh, in, the res in the results and knowing that should make us prayerful and courageous and bold um, so what you can do each morning and there I'll be honest with you there's sometimes I forget to do this because I think of my day and I realize I might not be engaging with a lot of people I might be making phone calls with members and doing administrative work or writing sermon or something like that but if I'm going to you know my day however the Lord leads say Lord Thank you for giving me this day. I don't know who we're going to meet today, but I pray that you would provide opportunities for me to talk to people about you, to express your love to them, uh, that you would open doors and help me to see those open doors and to walk through them. I'm going to leave the results in your hands. Prepare hearts. And when I've done that, this is a little bit, uh, you know, subjective, but I have sensed the Holy Spirit prompting me at times to say, speak up, you know, to this person or that person. And it's so much easier just to remain quiet. You know, it's like, well, I don't want to get into people's business. You know, they're doing something, I'm doing going to do. But there have been times, even in grocery lines, that something has come up. And uh, I say, do you live around here? And blah, 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 blah. Oh, do, do you have a church that you go to? You know, I'll say things like that and say, well, uh, and just invite them to church or, and talk about that. Or people will say something like they're having a terrible day and they say, wow, oh, I'm sorry to hear that. What's going on? And then you listen and say, well, can I pray for you about that? You'd be surprised. People, some people have never had someone pray for them aloud. Uh, so it means a lot to them. Agnes, now, I'm sorry, Agnes, I'm also pointing you out. Agnes does this a lot with families at the hospital that she knows aren't Christian. Muslim families, Hindu families, she'll go in and how do you say it? Do you say, may I, I pray in Jesus' name or you just do that? You say that. She says, may I pray for, for you and your child uh, in Jesus' name or something like that. I don't, has anyone said no? No one said no. Uh, so, um, 
you know, people appreciate that. They don't know what else to do in desperate times. Um, so that is something to think about. Use discretion. As I said, you don't want to just dump everything on someone uh, the first time you meet them. Uh, it, it may be a process. Uh, sometimes it is sudden. I mean, the Apostle Paul, that's one way God brings people to saving faith through some uh, very dramatic encounter or uh, allowing life to just fall apart so they come to the end of themselves and say, oh Lord, please, you know, rescue me as someone comes with the gospel and they, they become a Christian. For others, it's a process, just like the disciples. The disciples were very slow to understand Jesus. I mean, you're with Jesus in person, hearing him every day, and they still don't get it. And, and Jesus, you know, there are Jesus, Times Jesus says, oh, you little faith, or how can you not understand? So um, Jesus recognizes our frailty and limitations, but we should appreciate that people are in different stages. Some God has enlightened a little bit more than others along the way to, to get to the final destination. You have to meet people where they're at. Not that you don't know how to do this, but developing relationships, uh, getting to know your neighbors, get to know their names. Simple. Uh, do you know the names of all your neighbors and your, like, five houses around you or something like that? Uh, I, I, we interact with our neighbors. We're outside. I like to walk Eva around. It's a great way for me to talk to neighbors. <laughs> Oh, she's so cute. Yeah, she's my little And then we get into these conversations. Uh, other people have pets. <laughs> and that gets them into conversations. My granddaughter loves Ro uh, Roxy. Roxy is uh, this loving uh, female dog. I don't know. She's a mix of a pit bull and something else. But she's very friendly. She's short and weighs like 80 pounds. Very dense. But she loves to, to see her, and the Roxy runs over. So I'm getting to know this neighbor through that simple interaction. And uh, it's been very interesting, the kind of conversations that we have. But just the other day, I told Agnes, what is his name? I forgot his name, which makes it very awkward because I've encountered, I've talked to him a number of times, and now I forgot his name. So write it down. To do what I failed to do, write it down. Some people have uh, that app next door. <clears throat> that that helps, right? Is it anybody know what that is in your community? It, yeah. Um, smile, be friendly, be a good listener. Just don't talk. Uh, offer help with different things. Neighbors have done that for me. And, and we like to do that for others if they need help with something um, they're working outside. Do things together, try to cultivate common interests, uh, holidays, you know, inviting people over for different things or they invite you over. Give books, if you're talking about a subject and they bring up something, say, oh, I have a good book on that. Would you be interested in reading it? That might spur on conversation or invite them to Christian activities and events, especially if you have a home Bible study that you're hosting. That makes it very easy. So, you know, uh, on uh, Thursdays, we have a, a, a meeting in our home. It's very informal. It's a Bible study. We're all learning together. You don't even have to know much about the Bible at all to come. Just come and listen and enjoy the company. Great people in our study. We'd love you to be there. When I became a Christian, I didn't know two hoops about <laughs> anything in depth about the Bible. So when I went to a Bible study, I was just taking it in. And I'm so glad people didn't point me out and say, well, what do you think about that? I don't know. You know, you be sensitive to people who are new to the group. Don't put them on the spot like I did with Mel and Agnes. <laughs> um, 
Yes, so we have events, right? Uh, we have our Christmas Eve service. I, I wanted that to be a, uh, an event where it was focused more on outreach. I will let you know when we're going to have a service or a program that I know I'm going to be very intentional in laying out the gospel very clearly because this is an opportunity for you to invite people to, to come. And then you have to follow up with them though. You have to ask them, what do you think? Did that make sense to you? Do you have any questions about that? Um, and well, how, how do you, how, how are you going to respond to that? Whatever you want to say, but you, you have to take it from uh, there. Sometimes opportunities will present themselves to you. Do you remember the episode with the Ethiopian eunuch, with Philip? So now I was never transported <laughs> to some place to say, oh, where am I? Oh, hey, there's a guy down there praying. What are you reading? Uh, but someone, you know, this eunuch was reading something and uh, so Philip comes by, hey, what are you reading? I'm reading something and I don't understand what the prophet is trying to say. And it's from Isaiah 53, 52 or 53. And, and he goes, well, I can help you with that. And, uh, and of course, he became a believer and was baptized on the spot. And Ethiopia, through that man and his witness, became one of the leading Christian countries in you know the ancient world and um, still uh, there is very strong presence they have like the Ethiopian Coptic Church um, and I, I'm sure there's some evangelical churches there too but a uh, long history there so people can be reading something uh, listening to something uh, some they had a conversation with someone they heard something and you know you just it just comes up and that's an opportunity for you to to talk if someone tells me uh, that someone died recently or uh, that is an opportunity to talk to them about uh, the gospel not to say anything about where their relative is but to say you know it is tough I'm, I'm I'm very, very sorry. It, that, when those things happen so suddenly, it really makes all of us think, you know, are we ready to, to, to meet God? Have, have you ever given thought to that? Or, you know, how sure are you? And, and you just kind of get into it. You be sensitive. If something just happened and it's very raw, you, you want to comfort the person. You don't want to just get in. To a, a theological conversation but it can come afterward God will surprise you different things people will say uh, that will will come up others uh, other opportunities you need to take advantage of so Paul is traveling and uh, he goes down to uh, the river and there's a bunch of ladies there and they're washing clothes and doing other things now, what can Paul do? Paul can just sit there and say, boy, do I need a rest. I've been walking for miles. How long have we walked in the last few months? Uh, 300 miles. Oh, my feet are tired. I'm just gonna put them in the river, cool river, and relax, and not pay attention to these people right over here. Uh, that would be easy to do. Uh, we can do that. We could just cut, cut that off and say, okay, I need time. Sometimes we do need time, I'm not neglecting that. But Paul sees this and strikes up a conversation and uh, he shares the message of the gospel and it says that the Lord opened Lydia's heart to receive the message. How did Paul know that she would be ready? Should he have assumed, you know, these ladies are busy, they probably don't wanna to talk to me and uh, they're amongst themselves and I don't want to disrupt them, they probably won't believe anyway. You can adopt that attitude. That's not a faithful uh, 
hopeful, prayerful attitude, is it? You're praying for people, God open people's hearts, then trust that he's going to do that. Is it gonna happen every time? No. But you don't know until you actually launch out in faith and talk. And uh, th so that's a, uh, a beautiful uh, example of God at work in a unexpected situation. Paul didn't have any previous relationship with this person. It wasn't like, okay, I want to be your friend. It's going to take, take 10 months for me to develop a nice friendship with you in order to share the gospel. <laughs> it's like, here is an opportunity. Let's see what happens. And you say, oh, Frank, that's the Apostle Paul. Well, we have the same spirit as the Apostle Paul. We're not inspired like the Apostle Paul, but this was on his mind. I mean, this is how he thought and relating to people. People need the gospel. I'm going to take advantage of opportunities. Were there ministry opportunities that Jesus did not act upon? Absolutely. People think that you know Jesus took every opportunity he could. No, no, no. He's feeding the crowds, healing them. And what does he do? He breaks away to be with his father. And he says, okay, it's time to go to the other side. There's other towns and villages where I need to preach the good news. But Jesus, all these people, there's still more people to minister to here. Now, I would feel somewhat burdened to say, well, oh, look at these. There's a line. They're expecting you. And Jesus said, no, I, I have to move on. This is my father's plan. You cannot meet every need. So just... Give yourself grace on that one. You have, you know, life is full of relationships. You have your relationship with God, your relationship with your spouse, your relationship with your family, friends, church, outsiders, you know, acquaintances, work, all these things. You just need wisdom and discretion to know, okay, when, where am I going to, to take advantage of these opportunities? You, it's impossible to, to meet every need. And that's why in a church there are elders and deacons, because if the pastor tried to do everything, you know, he would lose his hair like me. Wait, I have lost my hair. Something's wrong. <laughs> um, okay, so what, let me see if we don't, we don't really have enough time to do this. I don't know. Camille, can I just ask you a question, like right in the middle of the class? Are you leading singing today? I'm done at this Okay, all right. Do you need to practice at 10? Probably. Okay, all right. Okay, I just want to be sensitive to that. Our dear brother Chris is not with us today, so we need to be in prayer for uh, their family. What I'm going to do, I'm going to do a role play next week. So we've been talking about how to do this and on a more of an abstract basis. I want it to be practical, but next week I'm gonna do a role play and uh, we'll, we'll see how, how uh, that goes. So you see the, how, how it would naturally, hopefully naturally, turn into a conversation and um, putting all these things together. What I want to accomplish in the next two weeks, besides that role play, is dealing with objections. So a little bit of apologetics because people are going to have objections. They're going to say, well, I don't even believe God exists. Um, how can I trust your Bible? Well, what about evil and suffering? My, my uh, child died of cancer. What kind of God would allow that to happen? There are all sorts of things that people can bring up. Some are genuine, that they're real intellectual or emotional barriers. Some are just smokescreen because they don't want to uh, hear anything that might convict them or challenge their lifestyle or morality. Um, but I think it's important to have, uh, to equip you a little bit. Some of you may feel comfortable in that area already, but instead of getting into very, very long, again, explanations, 
there are some things that you could say that are sufficient to cover the topic and then move on. And what I usually do with people is I'll say to them, that's a very good question. Let me just finish what I was explaining to you about what the message is, and then I will get back to that. Otherwise, you'll get off on endless tangents and spend two hours having theological, philosophical uh, conversations and never finish presenting the gospel. You don't want to do that. So uh, on the 23rd, we're having a congregational meeting. So we're going to end by that time. And then Dr. Kistler is going to start a series on the attributes of God. And that should be a wonderful series. Yes, Whitney is, a, is, a, is Dr. Kistler's number one fan, I think. <laughs> uh, but uh, Dr. Kistler, uh, his, all that he has gleaned from the Puritans makes his teaching very, very rich. Okay, well, we're out of time. Let's go ahead and pray, and uh, thank you again for coming this morning. Heavenly Father, we do thank you, Lord, that you continue to teach us how to engage our world. Lord, in one sense, it's very simple, and the gospel itself is simple, uh, but we also need to think through uh, what what we are going to say and what would communicate to different people where people are at. We can hear the message in such a way, even though it doesn't change uh, to address people's situations and their needs. And of course, their greatest need for the gift of forgiveness, they have to deal with their sin we do pray father that you would give us opportunities that you would open doors for us to talk to friends neighbors relatives others in our lives that you've put in our lives providentially they're there for a reason where we are where we are for a reason even the neighborhood that we live in so it's no accident but we ask that you would give us the ability to take the initiative in the power of the Holy Spirit to share the gospel, lead the results to you, knowing that you will work your way in your timing. Help us to be patient, not disappointed and frustrated when we don't see results. Uh, ultimately, it's all in your hands, and we're grateful that, uh, and also amazed, Lord, that you do chose to use us to be your partners in this ministry of reconciliation. We praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.